The views expressed are solely those of the individuals providing them, and do not reflect the opinions of the Team Sakpase podcast or their respective affiliates or sponsors. This episode is sponsored by LS Cream, the perfect blend of spices and tradition inspired by Haitian cremas. Please drink responsibly. Sock Passe, what's going on, world? Welcome to another episode of the Team Sock Passe Podcast. My name is Glad. And I'm your boy, Rob. Remember, we are your favorite Team Sock Passe Podcast show where we interview great entrepreneurs from all sectors of industry. Remember, subscribe, share, comment below. Subscribe, share, comment below. Glad. We did I'm it. speechless, bro. Episode 50. <laughs> episode 50. Make some noise, make some noise, yeah. make some noise. Yeah. You see the balloons in the background. Yes, yes, Stop yes. playing. Thank you see in the red yes, and blue. Yes, we repping. Yes. Repping yes. Haiti. Yo, episode 50 is. Episode 50. Woo. And we got to thank our guest because he's the one who provided the balloons. Thank you, my brother. How you doing? You're very welcome. I'm Woo. great today. Hey, we have our brother. Mr. Andre Green and 50 episodes. Here's the tagline: 50 episodes is gonna change your life mm, because mm. we're talking about life insurance. True. And our brother right here, he knows all about it. He's very knowledgeable. We met this guy a couple of weeks ago at a conference, and uh, we just hit it off right away, man. And uh, very knowledgeable, and you know, you you um, you're all about the community. Yes. And we're gonna talk about it. We want to talk about it from the beginning, bro. So Mr. Andre Green. Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate allowing me to be here. For the big five zero, it's, yes, it's yes. a big deal. So yes. I want to bring a little gift in y'all colors. Appreciate. it. I also got dressed for y'all yeah. in y'all colors. Yes, yes, appreciate yes, it, man. Yes. It means just, a lot. I uh, know what you guys are doing means a lot to the community, not just your community, but our community on a whole. Because right. having these type of conversations don't they don't happen enough. Mm -hmm. They don't happen in the right in the right context, right, with the right people. So you know, you guys are doing beautiful, amazing things. I want you to keep you guys. I want to congratulate you now and give you all flowers now. Keep doing what you guys have been doing because it does mean a lot. Which, and also, I made a point to be here because I was supposed to be gone yesterday. Yeah, but wow. I came. I ma I extended my trip just just to make sure I was here for you yeah, guys. Yeah, this today. was this was definitely I, I definitely appreciate it, and we we're appreciative of everything and changing your plans for us. So yeah, let's 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 get right into it, man. Man, um, when we spoke. A couple of weeks ago, you gave us a little bit of background. I know you're from Queens, so it's, it's, it's Queens. <laughs> Jamaica. There's, there's Jamaica, Queens. Queens, Queens, Queens is in the building. Is. Queens get the money. So there's, yes. there's a lot of people in Queens here, so I ain't going to yeah. say nothing. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, you got it. But uh, we want to know more, man. Tell us tell us a little about your background. Like, How did you get started? How did you get into real estate? Like, Where did the journey start for you? Well, you mean insurance. How did I get into insurance? Well, uh, before life insurance. Right. I was in real estate like, first. Yeah, in, yeah. in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the beginning for me started out, um, it started in real estate for me. So um, I was actually, you know, what's it's a good story because life comes full circle, right? When you're in service to other people, karma comes back your way. So how I got into real estate was because I was volunteering for a nonprofit for about a year when I was in college. I went to St. John's also in Queens. So I got to plug wow. Queens every time I chance, every chance I get. Okay. But I was volunteering at a nonprofit and from the nonprofit, you know, you, it's, it's free. Like I'm helping out and the, the nonprofit at the time um, would help high school students get their GEDs if they dropped out of high school for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's for pregnancy. Sometimes, it, you know, people get caught up in the streets and they left school for whatever reason. The, the nonprofit helps you get your GED so that you can then now find a, a future platform to work, get, get your papers and, and, and do something better with your life than just dropping out of high school. Mm -hmm. So working with, with Jackie, who was a person who ran a nonprofit, she was the executive director, I was there for about six to eight months, and then at one point I said to her, Jackie, I love helping people, but I'm, in high, I'm a broke college student. I need to start making some money. She's like, well, what do you want to do? I'm like, I have no idea. She's like, well, talk to my friend Barbara. Barbara just so happened to be a real estate broker, and she wasn't just a regular real estate broker. Barbara was the number one timeshare real estate broker in the country. That's what she did, and she's a Trinidadian woman born in, well, she lives in Queens for a long time. I'm not, she wasn't born there, but she's been there for a long time. So I went to go work with Barbara. Barbara taught me all of the ABCs of the real estate game, how to do rentals, how to find clients, how to prospect, how to market. And I did that. I was doing Section 8 rentals for about a year and some change. And I don't know if you guys have any experience with Section 8 rentals. It's a nightmare. You've got, everyone's got caviar dreams on a bare budget. It doesn't work. But 
it taught me how to, one, deal with clients, how to manage clients, how to help them find what they're looking for. And that progression of, of, of what to do in the business sort of opened my appetite up to, well, what else can I do in real estate? That then, f fast forward a few years, I became a real estate, uh, sorry, I got my real estate license. I also went and started working in mortgages. This is prior to 2008, so 2005, 2006, I was in mortgages as a cold caller, telemarketer. I used to call you at five o'clock in the evening when you got home from work. Hey, how you doing, Glad? I want to talk to you about your mortgage today. Like, no one wanted to talk to me, but that also, <laughs> exactly. It was who, bang, who bang, this? bang. Who is this guy? Yeah, yeah but you know, that, that builds tough skin. Right, because how many times are you going to hear no before you quit? And that's what that's what that that taught me, right? So doing that for a few years, um, I eventually became a real estate broker. Um, after I left the mortgage, the, the mortgage meltdown in 2008 sort of shifted everyone. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't stay in the business, you sort of went somewhere else. I went into property management. So 2008 into 2009, started working for a bank doing property management. And while I was there, I built up enough um, experience that I was able to take my broker's exam to be a, a licensed New York real estate broker. And for those who don't know, you can be an agent, but you work for a broker. If you're a broker, you work for yourself, right? So you don't, you don't need anyone above you. You write your own, you sign your own name, you write your own checks at that point. With an agent, you have to work under a broker to be able to do deals. So I was doing that for a couple of years. And while I was doing that, my background when I was doing mortgages was I worked a lot with investors. So I had a lot of contacts with short sales, banks, attorneys, all of that stuff. So even while I was working my nine to five job, and I'm a huge advocate of keeping your nine to five when you're building any business. Don't just, don't follow the, the online gurus. Don't leave your job and go figure out how to pay your bills next month. It's a bad idea. So I did that for years. I worked a nine to five and I, I hustled on the side. And in doing that, a lot of people in my, my network and my friends and family knew that, well, if you got a real estate deal and it's kind of weird, call Andre. What happened three, three times in the same year is that, I don't know, we spoke about this before um, with Glad, is that I was getting introduced to families that were losing their homes. And when you start to dig down as to why they're losing their homes, it was because no one gave them enough financial information so that they knew what to do if this happened. And the story that sort of prompted me to go get, go get my, my uh, insurance license was, I had a family of four kids. Their mom passed away. She, she had the house for 40 years because her, her and her husband bought it when they were young. They raised all the kids there. They had grandkids. That everyone, lived, everyone knew this was a family house. After mom passed away, the four kids got together and like, well, we got to sell the house. So a friend of a family member called me. He's like, Andre, can you go talk to them? We're not really sure what's going on, but we know we trust you. We can, you can help them. I went and sat down with them, and we, they told me the whole story. I'm like, well, what happened? Well, mom took out a reverse mortgage because she wanted to give the money to her kids and her grandkids while she was alive. It's very noble. She wanted to watch them enjoy the money while she was here, which is nothing wrong with that. The piece that was left out in, in the thought process was, well, what happens when mom's not here anymore? With a reverse mortgage, how it, how it works is the bank pays you to live in the house. And then if you move or if you pass away, so if you go from, if you're alive and you move into a nursing home, or if you pass away, you have six months from the day that you vacate the house to pay back the loan. Right. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. So mom passes away, six months, when well, they're in that six month period, they're like, we can't afford the house. And just to put it into context, the youngest person of the four kids I was talking to was 65 years old. Wow. And they had no idea what to do. They couldn't afford to buy the house. And at that age, you would think, you know, you've accumulated enough wealth, enough money, you can buy the house back mm -hmm. from, your, from your mom. Mm -hmm. They couldn't do so. So I'm in the house as, an, as a realtor, as a broker, telling them, don't sell the house. Keep the house. We can figure it out. They're like, no, we can't keep the house. We don't want the house. Just sell the house. And for them, they're like, we don't want any money. Just sell it. We don't care what she owes. We don't care how much we can get. Just sell the house because we can't deal with it. And when I asked them in the conversation, well, did anybody talk to mom about getting a life insurance policy? They're like, for what? Like, why would we want to get a life insurance policy? The basics of it is if she would, if mom would have, I know she was older, right? So the older you get with life insurance, the more it costs. But if she would have got a basic term policy that would have lasted her for, let's say, for 20 years, and it would have been more than the mortgage amount, when she passed away, the money would have get, got sent to the kids. They could have pulled it together and paid off the house. At that point, they have a choice. Do we want to keep the house? Do we want to sell the house? Do we want the grandkids to live in the house? 
we can keep the house in the family and build a legit legacy with this asset that their that their parents, which is now your grandparents, have bought 40 years ago. And that's how generational wealth starts to build because you buy it, one generation buys it and then passes it to the next one and then passes it to the next one. But that has to be done properly. So long story short, that's how I got into insurance because that happened to me in the middle of um, 2019, 2018, 2019, one of those years. That's when it happened. And it was from that experience. I'm like, I'm not doing enough mm. with the knowledge that I have in my head to educate my community. So now I need to go and figure out how do I put myself in a position to not, not just tell you about what you should do, but actually help you facilitate getting life insurance, educating you on life insurance so that you can now do the proper, put the proper things in place to benefit your family for not just you and this generation, for, for generations to come. Wow, well said. You just set the foundation for the, right. for the rest of the interview. Wow, so going back to when you started life insurance, and you were like going through that time were there other people asking you the same question over and over again about life insurance or was it just that specific family that was like that so kind of changed that specific family never asked me about life insurance right it was they were talking to me about real estate because i've been doing real estate for over two decades at this point right now right and i brought insurance to them as a conversation because I realized that they didn't know that that one extra piece would have changed this entire conversation. Uh, okay. okay, I got you. Got and you. That's, that's where life insurance, for me, it told me I need to go, go get relicensed because I was licensed before when I used to work for the bank when I was doing property management. Mm -hmm. It was just one of the things that, one of the weird bank rules, if you work here, you have to get ins licensed for insurance because the bank sells insurance, like inside the bank. They can sell it to clients. So they made me get it. And I had it for a while. I let it lapse. I had to go retake the test. But then what I decided to do in 20, 2019 was I wanted to go open a full real estate broker, I mean, sorry, full insurance brokerage. So the insurance brokerage does not only life insurance, but we do homeowner's insurance, renter's insurance. We do life insurance, business insurance, construction insurance. If the word insurance is in it, we can facilitate you getting it as a brokerage. And we don't just work with one company. We have over 100 companies available to us to make sure we're providing you, our client, with the right product. So we're not selling what the insurance company wants. We're giving you what you need. Okay, and it's it's yourself, but with you and other partners. So it's I own the company, and I have other other employees that work with the company. I have um, seasoned people who are over fifteen years in the business that do my processing, that do my back end work. We have front front end salespeople that go out there and you know meet and greet, shake shake hands, kiss babies, and do all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gotcha. So let's get into it, man. I mean, we're here to talk about life insurance. Uh, I guess the first question is on the basics. Just give us the basics. We'll we'll get more complicated as we as the interview goes on. Okay. But let's talk about the basics as far as what one person needs out there to get life insurance. What, what do they need to get qualified? Tell the different types of uh, insurances that are out there. I believe it's term, whole life. Let's, let's get into that. Right. So first thing, I'll, before I even tell you what's available, I want to tell you who needs life insurance. Right. Who's, the, who's a, a candidate for life insurance? Mm -hmm. So one, if you're alive, you need life insurance. That is the basic of it. Because the most valuable thing that any one person owns is their own life. And we can go into a very deep political conversation about how we are treated in America and how our youth are treated in the street when they get stopped by the police and all of these other things that, that may happen. But the baseline is your life is valuable. It's worth something. So if you're alive, you need life insurance. Now, what do I need life insurance for becomes the next question. If you are a person who owns anything, and when I say anything, I'm talking about anything that has value, real estate, stocks, bonds, um, cars, you name it. If you, most people have insurance on their cell phone and do not have insurance on their life. Wow, that's a fact. That's crazy. And that insurance is <laughs> 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 that right there, my friend, is so true. That's true. And that's that's yeah, crazy, yeah, right? Yeah. You you don't want to spend a thousand dollars to replace your cell phone, but how much does it cost to replace you? <laughs> mm. Bars. So where do, where do you think that comes from, though? Like, oh, man, you can, like how I know much you, time I, you got, right? No, 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 <laughs> no, I know you said that everyone needs insurance. Yes. You know. Everyone that owns everything, anything, anything, yeah, yeah, we need insurance. But then, in our culture, not everyone has it, right? And I, a lot of it comes from there's a stigmatism or a myth that if I talk about my death, I talk about making plans for my life after I'm gone, something's gonna happen to me now. 
the, I, I mean, culturally, you know, our grandparents don't want to have those conversations. Our aunts and uncles don't want to have those conversations. But whether we talk about it or not, there's two things that are guaranteed to happen in our lifetime. We're going to pay taxes and we're going to die. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter what you do. Those yep. are going to happen. Absolutely. Right. So yeah. what are you planning for? Right. You got you, you make plans for everything else, but you don't plan for what. And I mean, for people who don't have kids, it's, it's a little bit of a harder conversation because once you become a parent, you naturally inherently understand that you are responsible for another person. Right. And if you have a child, you want to make sure that the person, this person that you brought into the world who didn't ask to be here is here and they're your responsibility. So how do I protect them even if I'm not here? And financially is one of the most apparent ways that we can do that. Right. So we want to leave money behind for them. But what else we can do is we can also leave assets behind for them. And depending on their age, when you know, you're no longer here to take care of them, it will dictate or determine how much of an asset you can leave to them. And then do they understand what to do with that asset once you're not here to tell them what to do, right? But to answer your first question, right? So who needs life insurance? If you are a working person and anyone is responsible or dependent upon you for any type of income, you should have life insurance. A lot of people that I have conversation with will tell me, oh, I have life insurance. I'm like, great, where is it, where is it from? Oh, I have it through my job. Okay, well, I mean, that's good that your job offered it to you, but let's look at that realistically, right? Most job life insurance plans offer one and a half times your salary. So what does that mean in numbers? If you are getting paid $100,000 a year, your life insurance policy at your job will pay out $150,000 if you pass away while you're working there. Not if it happens at work, but while you're employed with that company, you die, they will pay out $150,000 to whoever your benef beneficiary is. So I'm 26, I'm working at a regular job, at a bank, at a uh, financial firm, at McDonald's, wherever. Something happens to me while I'm at work, or while, while I'm working there, life insurance will pay out. But what happens if I was 26 when I started my job, I'm now 36 and I got a new job because it's paying me more money. I switch jobs. Does my new job offer me life insurance? And if they don't, how much does it cost me now, 10 years older, to try and go and get life insurance? That's the part that people don't think about. Because the, the one thing we cannot get back in life is time. So yeah, life insurance is fine and dandy, and everyone thinks about it when they're like in their 50s and 60s, but when you should really be thinking about life insurance is when you're in your 20s and 30s. Because if you can get it at such a young age, it's really, really affordable. And then it stays with you for the rest of your life, right? But I, I got ahead of myself, so let me let me go back. Let me go back. Let me go back. No, you good? You good? <laughs> let me go back. Let me go back. This is your episode. <laughs> you, want, you wanted episode fifty. You got it, man. Got talk, right. talk to the people. Talk to so the people. So here we go. So life insurance in general, right? There's term insurance and whole life insurance. Term insurance is like car insurance. It lasts for however long you have it. Normally it's 10, 20, or thirty years. There's some new products out now for forty years, right? So if anything happens to you during that period of time. As long as you're paying your premiums and your insurance policy is in place, they will pay out, right? So you can have as low as a $10,000 insurance policy on a term policy, all the way up to millions of dollars. And just to give you an idea, a 40 to 50 year old male can get a, a million dollar insurance policy paying about 300 some dollars a month. Keep in mind, you know, your health and all that stuff comes into place, but you can get a lot of coverage for a little bit of money, right? That's a term policy. A whole life policy is the other half of the same equation. With a whole life policy, no matter what age you get it at, it lasts for the rest of your life. So it doesn't expire in 10, 20, or 30 years. It goes until 121 years of age. Most people don't live that long. So it's guaranteed to pay out, to pay you the money to your beneficiary. It does cost substantially more, but the reason why it costs more is because they're gonna guarantee to pay it out to someone. So they make sure they uh, recoup those costs. These insurance companies are very, very smart people. So they're not doing things that don't necessarily work for them that also work for you. Got you. So, but here's my question. When it comes to term, mm -hmm. let's say that same 36 years old male, he's, he, he has a term life, let's yep. say. Term policy, okay. Term policy. Yep. So then that policy is over. So, so he's 66 at the time that that policy would be over. It'd be 66. Yeah, because 30 but, years. Right. So right. 30 years. But now he has to get another term. He, he could, right? So mm -hmm. if, he, if he's getting good financial advice, he would have got two policies when he was 36 years old. 
He would have got a term policy because at bare minimum, he can afford that. If he, if, he can, if he has a little bit of extra income, he can get a whole life policy also. And we'll talk about how creative and fun we can get with the whole life policy in a second. But the reason why I have, to, I have multiple policies, right? And the reason is, is for exactly what you said. At a certain age, that term policy is going to go away, right? So what is there to replace it? I got a whole life policy to replace my term policy. But what, why did I get a whole life policy to replace my term policy? Because my term policy, my whole life policy, is building cash value and increasing death benefit over time. So I sent both of you guys illustrations, right? Yes, thank you. Yes. No problem. Yeah. When you guys get a chance, I want you to look at them, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you look at the illustrations I sent you guys, it starts off really low, let's say 150, 175,000 for the death benefit. But as time goes on and you look down the, down the illustration, the death benefit also increases. So let's say you had a half a million dollar um, term policy at 36, and you got a $100,000 whole life policy also at 36. By the time that whole life policy reaches a half a million dollars in death benefit value, mm -hmm. it's 30 years down the line. So when your term policy ends, because your term policy is $500,000 day one, your whole life policy is $100,000 day one. It builds value over time. The term policy stays the exact same value the entire time. So then what's the purpose of having a term life? Like, what are the benefits of having a term life policy? The benefits are, one, it's extremely cheap to have a term policy. So you get $500,000 for argument's sake for $40 a month. You're not getting that anywhere else. But what happens if you don't make it to 66? You've got $500,000 any day of the year for 30 years going to your beneficiaries. And, I mean, we can have a million different conversations, right? If I'm having this conversation with you in 2000. And one, in August, you would never think that 9-11 was going to happen. If I'm having this conversation with you in 2020, February, you would never think that in March we're going to have the pandemic, right? Life changes really, really fast. And we don't know when it's, when it's our time. So all we can do is plan and prepare for it. So that's why I tell people, if you can afford it, have both. If you can't afford it, at least have term insurance. Because if you own any assets, it will cover your assets, right? So let's use term insurance for the conversation. Mm -hmm. I have, I'm, I'm 36 years old, and I own a house. Me, my wife, and my two kids. I'm not the only breadwinner in the house, so my, I'm working, my wife's working. But they use both of our incomes to qualify for the loan. Why is that? We, we need enough money between both of us to afford this house in Queens, in Queens Village, right? House in Queen's Village right now is about $600,000 for a single family. If something happened to me, can my wife afford to pay the mortgage, which is $3,500, $4,000 a month, on her own with one salary, taking care of two kids? Most conversations, the answer is no. So we get a $600,000 term policy that costs us $75 a month. That we're going to pay that every single month when we pay our mortgage. If something happens to either one of us, me and my wife both have our own policy separate of each other. If something happens to either one of us throughout the next 30 years, the house, the, the life insurance will pay out the death benefit of $600,000. I take that money, if it's my wife that passes away, and I pay off the house. Now, me and the kids can stay in the house and we got to pay taxes and the water bill and stuff, but we, can, we have time to figure out, do we want to stay here? Is a, is, do we have so many memories that we need to move? There's not a scramble because what happens when most when someone passes away and you're not financially prepared for it is you're in gr you're in a grief state, you're grieving of the loss of a loved one, and now you have to make financial decisions that affect the rest of your life in a mental state that you should not be making any financial decisions on. And that's why I say at least term insurance you should have that to cover whatever assets you do have. I hope that answered the question. No, definitely. No, you cleared that up. I mean, that's For a sure. great example with the house situation. Yeah. So now, whole life. Mm -hmm. so let's take that same family. Yep. They said, you know what? We can afford a whole life insurance now. Okay. How does that scenario play out? So I will say this first and foremost. Life insurance is not an investment. And I want everybody to be really clear about that, right? Because you, you'll see it online, on Instagram, on TikTok, YouTube. People will compare life insurance policies to investments like real estate, like the stock market. It's not that. The closest thing to a life insurance policy is your bank account. So think of life, life insurance as a savings or a checking account, right? There's money in there. You need access to it. You can get to it if you need it. The bank gives you some interest, right? 0.03. Now it's going up. So maybe like maybe 1%. 
you can set up a whole life policy to have it's it's two parts to one whole life policy. There is the life insurance part, which is part A, and then there is cash value, which is part B. So A and B go together. Let's just say, for example, I run an illustration for for Rob, and Rob says, I ask Rob, Rob, how much money do you normally save every single year? Rob says, I save about ten thousand dollars a year. I'm like, okay, good. What I'll do is I'll set up a life insurance policy for Rob based on him saving $10,000 a year. Now, yes, when you have a life insurance policy, you're going to have to pay for the actual life insurance. Let's say for Rob, that, that's $2,000. So of the $10,000 that he normally saves, we got to take $2,000 of that ten dollars and put it to pay for life insurance, which is going to build up over time, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to start off with Rob's life insurance is for $175,000 year one, and over time, it goes up incrementally. But you also have the $8,000 out of that 10000 So you put the money into the policy, 2000 of it automatically goes to life insurance, the other 8000 sits in your policy, and it gains interest. Now, let's say two weeks, sorry, two months after you open that account, your car breaks down. Right? It's life. Life happens. Yeah, when you're not right. ready for it is when yeah. it happens to you. Yep. Right. Yep. So two months later, your car breaks down, and you need $2,500 to fix your car. Mm -hmm. If the money was in your savings account, you normally just go to the bank, make a withdrawal. I got to yeah. need $25. I got to fix my brakes or my, right. or my transmission or whatever it is. Right. With the whole life policy, you have the same flexibility. You can contact the insurance company and say, I need $2,500 $2, for my policy. The difference is you're not taking money out of your policy. You're borrowing money from your policy. So you're going to get a loan for $2,500. Okay. What's the next question you guys are normally going to ask me if I tell you taking a loan out? What if you can't pay it back? <laughs> what if you can't, <laughs> can't pay, pay it back, back right? <laughs> so if you take a loan from your policy and you can't pay it back, when you pass, mm -hmm. because it's guaranteed to happen, mm -hmm. your life insurance will take whatever you borrowed against your policy, it will deduct that from your death benefit. So let's say, let's knock on wood, you know, it doesn't, we don't want it to happen, but five years down the line, you borrowed $2,500, you never paid it back. It's accruing interest, so let's say you owe $3,500 at the time that you pass away. Mm -hmm. But your death benefit is $200,000 now. Well, two fifty dollars now because you started at one fifty. dollars It's at two hundred two fifty dollars now. They're going to do $250,000 go to GLAD as your beneficiary minus the $3,500 you owed on that loan. So GLAD gets the two fifty dollars minus the $3,500. He gets all that money in cash, and he doesn't pay taxes on it, which is another benefit. And he had no idea he was getting two fifty dollars anyway. So you didn't pay the loan back. It's taken from your death benefit. They give the rest of the money to Glad. Everything's done. God, got it. Okay. Wow. Uh, I got so many questions. Okay. Hit me with them. Hit me uh, with them. Um, <laughs> so what other cool things can you do with a with a whole life with a whole life policy? Policy. Okay. So a lot of people have been hearing and talking about what's called infinite banking. So infinite banking, or also known as become your own bank, is very popular nowadays because you have the ability to become your own bank. You save money, which is a piece everybody doesn't really talk about that much. You have to save money in your policy first to then be able to borrow money against it. So the same conversation with Rob. He's putting in $10,000 a year into his policy. $8,000 of that is liquid cash to him, right? We do this for 10 years, right? We're saving money because you're, you're going to save the money anyway, right? Yes. So we're saving money every single year. 10 years down the line, he's got $80,000 saved up in his, in his account. That's liquid to him. He also has death benefit. We're not going to talk about that. Rob says, you know what? I started this thing when I was relatively young. I want to go buy a house. Most people don't realize that your a whole life policy is an asset because you now have liquid cash that you can show to the bank as how much money do you have for down payment? Well, I got $80,000 that I can tap into. Okay, so you need $50,000 to buy this house. You, grab 50, you borrow $50,000 from your policy and then you put it as your down payment. Now you have the option, as we already spoke about, you can pay it back or not pay it back. If you pay it back, you know, because you bought, you bought the house, you pay it back, you now have $50,000 plus the 30 that was in there, you're back to $80,000 plus the interest that you've been accruing over time in your policy. Now you said, yo, I got the house, family set, we're good, we have some place to live, but I found a really good investment property. What's the first thing you think about? I need a down payment. Right. You go back to the same $80,000 you put back in the account. You go borrow $40,000 this time for a down payment on an investment property. But that investment property is supposed to be making you money because you're renting it out to tenants. So every single month, you're getting some cash flow off of that property. You take a little piece of it and pay it back, pay back your, your life insurance policy, and you keep the rest for your cash flow. You're spending money every day. You want to go 
buy a drink, buy some sneakers, go hang out, take the family on vacation. Your money's coming from the cash flow from your investment. And the thing that everyone's talking about now is passive income. I want to have passive income. The only way to get real passive income is you have to own things. If you don't own anything, you're not getting any passive income. So this now asset, this investment becomes passive income to you, and you use that money, you pay back your life insurance, you keep the rest, the rest of the cash flow to hopefully reinvest it into other things. That process of you borrowing money from yourself and paying it back is what you do with the bank. The difference is you pay the bank interest, you don't see any benefit from it. When you do it from your life insurance policy, you're paying yourself interest. Mm, so okay. you, you're, I mean, this is great. That's a great example. So you're basically saying you set up, you get this insurance, the whole life insurance basically to help you create passive income opportunities. Absolutely. Because it's an option for you. And that's, that's the number one thing in life is about having multiple options. Now, mm -hmm. here's a question. I just want to make sure that we have this on camera. Mm -hmm. um, when you get your uh, whole life insurance, how soon are you able to take funds out? If your policy is set up properly, you can borrow money from your policy 31 days after you put the money in there. So we're going to keep using Rob's example as the example, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're doing $10,000. Keep in mind, I met Rob as an adult, right? So he should have already had some money in his savings account because he was already saving money. Because the conversation that Rob and I had was, how much money did you save last year? Oh, well, I saved about $10,000. Mm -hmm. That tells me that Rob should have $10,000 in an account somewhere that he can access, right? So I tell Rob, listen, we can put the money into the li into life insurance policy. It's going to pay you to keep it conservative, mm -hmm. four to six percent on your money. Okay. Right. It's more than the bank's giving you anyway. Gotcha. Right. So when we do that, Rob puts the ten thousand dollars into his account day one. He pays the policy up in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So Rob has access to the eight thousand because we have to pay the two thousand for the life insurance. Right. He has access to the eight thousand thirty one days after he put the money in there. Let's say Rob doesn't have the $10,000 saved up somewhere else. Rob has to now pay, make his monthly payments every single month. So $10,000 divided by 12 is like eight seventy dollars a month. Mm -hmm. If he put in eight seventy dollars every single month, he has access to 80% of it every, every 30 days. So it's eight eight seventy dollars in January, February, March, April, May, June. Every single month he's making a payment, he has access to his cash 30 days after he makes the payment. Uh, okay. That makes sense? That makes sense. All right. So it just depends on how you put your money into your policy determines how much cash you have access to right away. Okay. That's the only difference. So, and also with when it comes to life insurance, the older you get, the more expensive, the it more is. expensive it is. Which is why I say people in their twenties and thirties should be looking at it because if you're sixty trying to do infinite banking, your premiums for your life insurance are going to be really high. And when I say really high, I'm talking about ten, fifteen thousand dollars a year. So in order for that to make sense for you, you mm -hmm. have to pay ten to fifteen thousand to get the policy. Then you have to dump another twenty, thirty thousand, thirty thousand dollars a year on top of that for it to make sense. It doesn't necessarily make sense for everybody financially to do that at that age. It makes more sense when you're younger, and you can you can get a policy as early as three months old. Gotcha. So I just want to let's say here's someone who's like in their 40s, early 40s, mid 40s, whatever, mm -hmm. has no savings. Mm -hmm. um, he's been, you know, he has really no financial, he or she has no financial background. They don't understand the life insurance game. Yep. But they want to get into it. Their family own a home. They want to just talk to the family about life insurance. Mm -hmm. But they, they themselves have, they have no savings or anything, but they want to get into it. But they want to say, okay, you know what? I have all I have is my job. Right. How do you t like? How do you? So the the honest answer is you have to start with discipline. Mm -hmm. If you're telling me you're in your mid forties and you have no savings at all, right? Something's happened throughout your life why you don't have you were not able to save. It might not even be your fault, right? You might right. have had the savings and had to spend it all. Someone had cancer or had an accident and you needed to dump all the money somewhere else. Right. Something happened that why you don't have any cash at mm -hmm. all saved up. Mm -hmm. If that's your case, you might not need a whole life policy. Okay. You at bare minimum need a term policy because you're telling me you have family that you're worried about. Like someone's was dependent upon you to make sure that they're taken care of later on. So maybe in that conversation, we're going to talk about your finances and you know what's going on and the, the overall health of your finances and say for right now, maybe you just get a term policy. Because if something did happen to you, what happens to all these people that you're worried about? Mm -hmm. 
do they do, do they depend on you for any type of financial responsibility? If the answer is yes, let's look at a term policy. Right. Now so we're gonna term, have a okay. term policy where where is where the conversation would start with with me and that person, mm -hmm. just to say just some protection, cover your assets, <laughs> get term insurance, right? Mm -hmm. And if that person understands that concept, then a year or two down the line, I'm not going anywhere, right? This business is relationship business. So one of the reasons why I got into it is because I understand that if I'm helping you plan and prepare for your family, this is a long-term game, right? Your life changes over the years. Mm -hmm. Because if I taught you at 22, you, didn't, you weren't married, you didn't have any kids, your, your everybody's healthy, everything's fine. I taught you at 32, oh, well, I got married, I got a two-year-old, I have a two-year-old at home. I taught you at 42, oh, we have three kids now, we bought a house, we have a, we're getting a second home somewhere else. Your life evolves and changes, so your finances are also going to evolve and change. Are you prepared for life if something happens that you weren't planning for? And that's the conversation about life insurance and financial literacy that sort of comes into play for a lot of people that no one thinks about. So, yeah. Start with term, and then we sort of transition into a whole life because we need to build up that next step. Some people will tell you life insurance is a scam. Don't put your money in it. They're going to take it from you. I'll tell you this right now, and this is just the facts. For every $1 you put into a life insurance policy, you're getting $3 in the de uh, death benefit. So why no, no, any, any life insurance any policy. Life insurance. Any life insurance policy. If you're paying a dollar, the life insurance company is telling you they're going to pay you out three times whatever you put in. Now, people will tell you don't save money in your life insurance policy. That's a personal choice. Life insurance is a bad investment. I agree with that. Life insurance is not an investment. So you have to understand what vehicle you're getting into. One of the things I want us to touch on before we end today is IULs. IULs are a very big topic right now. Everyone's talking about it on, on the internet, on TikTok. Everyone's a financial guru until things fall apart. How many conversations do you hear about crypto still? True. Nobody's talking about yeah. that now, right? It, True. It, it went to hell. Nobody wants. Well, nobody wants to touch it. So you said IUL is a, it's an acronym for, for Index Universal Life. Okay. So it's a type of a whole life policy, mm -hmm. right? And the IULs are tied to uh, the stock market. They're not in the stock market, but they tie your cash value growth to the stock market. So normally it's the S and P 500. So if you take an IUL policy from an agent that's that's telling you about it, they're going to tell you things like. You have 10 to 12 percent growth of your cash. You have no downside. There's a floor. You can't go below this, so you won't lose any money. The part that they tend to leave out is that your life insurance policy that's attached to your IUL, the premium or your death benefit amount goes up over time also. So if your cash value goes up and your premium goes up, it has to get paid somehow. Normally, the IULs, they take your cash value to pay for your premium for your life insurance for that death benefit portion of it. Now, if you, look, if you compare them apples to apples over time, a whole life policy will outperform a IUL. In the short run, the IUL wins every single time because it has a lot of cash um, bounce in the beginning. But another thing is that you can't always access all of your cash in the IUL in the beginning. So the same example, like I told you, you got your policy and then two months later your car broke down. In an IUL, some of the policies, you can't access your money for one year, three year, five years, seven years. It's locked up. You can't get to it. Maybe you can borrow against it, but you have to be careful how you borrow against it because some of those actions might have consequences. But this is all in the details of how your policy was set up because whoever sets it up has to do it the ve a very precise way and do it right to not negatively affect you because the truth is when you realize that it was set up wrong, it's not a week later. It's not even a month later. It's not even a year later. It's only 5, 10, 15 years later that you realize that this product isn't a good product. And I'm talking from experience. My parents got me life insurance at 18. And it was through a very well-known, reputable company. Everybody knows who it is if I say the name. Mm -hmm. And the agent that set up the policy didn't do a really good job of explaining to my parents what they were giving to me for me. So when I went and tried to borrow money against it, the insurance company told me, if you, we'll give you the cash, but we won't close your policy after that. Wow. So, well, what benefit is it to me if I can't access my money, mm -hmm. right? It, there's, there's details in it. So make sure you, whoever's doing it for you, you know, trust, and, and believe that they're doing the right thing for you. So it does yeah. have some benefits. It just got to be set up properly. Correct. Yes. Gotcha. Yes. But, but IULs are very, very tricky. So be careful if you're going to get an IUL. I do not even sell IULs to anyone. If someone comes to me and says, I want an IUL, I tell them very nicely, 
Go find someone else who'll do it for you because I won't be able to sleep peacefully at night knowing I gave you one. <laughs> wow. So where did it get so popular? How did it get so popular? Well, you got to follow the money. Mm. So because of the st- because of stock market. Not even the stock market. Who's telling you about IULs? It's not it's not traders on the stock market. It's not CNBC. It's agents. Agents. Agents get paid large premium, large commission checks from IULs because if you look at you know, funny story right where we we, we posted something online. Mm-hmm. And someone in the comments said, life insurance is a bad investment. Don't put your money into it. Great yeah. segue. Yes. Right? Yes. yes. So I jumped into, into that person's profile to take a look and see, you know, one, where does the information come from? Is that person reputable? Do they know what they're talking about? I won't say what company they work for. But what I will say is that that company is known to recruit a lot of people to spread the word about life insurance. It's a good and it's a bad thing. The bad thing is that they're recruiting people as the means to get paid. They get paid off of, of recruitment. That's how their commissions really grow. The good news is that they're talking about life insurance. So when I looked at this, this person's profile, I noticed that one of their posts was that if you put money into your, into your life insurance policy, the first three years, you have no cash value. Why would you ever do that? That's a true statement. I would never do that. But that's because that policy wasn't set up properly for infinite banking. So if you don't set it up right, you're just going to lose a whole bunch of money in the beginning. But why are people talking about IULs to begin with? If they're not the greatest thing for the client, why would I tell you about it? Because in those first three years that you're paying, you know, 2,500, 5,000, 10,000 into a policy, I'm getting 50% commissions on the money you put into your policy that has zero cash value to you. Wow. Wow. Okay. Crazy. That's why everyone's that talking about it. They're getting sense. big checks for them. Big Buyer checks. beware. That's a checks. fact. That's so a he, he, here's a random question: um, Can a can a business take out an insurance policy? Absolutely, your job does it all the time. And and tell us an example of that. LLC. And an LLC. No, 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 no. I'm talking about your regular job. Well, no, what, no, no, what if you're an LLC? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll get to that part, but okay. you got to keep in mind that if, so if you ever walked into a bank, because banks are banks are known to have like the largest policies, life insurance policies. If you walk into a bank, and you go and you go to the teller, you go to the banker, you go to the manager. If you ever take a moment, ask the person you're talking to what's their official title at the bank. You're going to hear a lot of things like, I'm executive VP, I'm VP of this. They all have um, executive titles on their name. The reason why the, the bank does that, no matter what your job is in the bank, they want you to be an executive at a higher level. That's because they can borrow, they can get life insurance on you. So everyone tells you, oh, I have life insurance through my job. Okay, that's great. How much do you have? Wow. Normally, it's one and a half times your salary. Do you think that's the full amount of insurance that the job took out for you, though? So I make $100,000 a year. They say that if you pass away while you work here, we'll pay your family one fifty. But how much life insurance do you have on me as the person? Normally, it's half a million to a million dollars. But I'm going to give you one fifty though. Don't worry about it. I got you. Wow. So this is why the bank has the biggest promotion like they promote their people. They promote everybody, everybody as fast as Start possible. From the teller to then you go to customer relations and then you go to the client end. services. They're taking that insurance. They can take it out insurance. Uh, and you can only take out insurance on an executive at any level. They have to be an executive. They have to have some type of executive title. So if you're just a teller, we can't take insurance out of you. But if you're a teller, but you're also uh, executive, whatever, once you get that new title or that promotion, it changes your status in the company. Now the, the bank can take out an, a policy on you. And what do they do with that policy? They do the same thing I've been talking about. They put a bunch of money into it because they're paying into the policy because they can borrow the cash. I mean, if you want, you can. it's called Bold, Boldly, B-O-L-I. It's online. You can Google it. Go check and see. Bank of America, Chase, Wells Fargo. Look to see how much B-O-L-I, Boldly Insurance, they have at the bank. It's billions of dollars. It's not hundreds of thousands, it's billions. What are they doing with that money? They're just investing, playing around with the money. Well, they're borrowing the Bar- money to go it, invest and invest it into. In. So, little unknown fact: um, life insurance companies are the largest or the second largest owners of real estate in the United States. So they're taking your money, the, the life, the life insurance money, and they're buying hard assets with it. Because what what do you what are what are the benefits of life insurance? Right? Let's talk about it. It's tax-free when it, when it gets paid out to a beneficiary. Mm-hmm. It's tax-free when I borrow money against it. And it's tax-free if it's set up properly when I put money into it. 
because I have, I'm not a CPA, I'm not a financial advisor, I wanna put that out there now, right? But when you, when you set these things up properly, you can do a lot of creative things in accordance to the IRS because the biggest, biggest wealth stealer in America is the taxes that we pay. We pay taxes on everything. We go to work, we get taxed. We leave work and go buy food, we get taxed. We buy clothes, we get taxed. We buy cars, we get taxed. Everything you do, you pay tax. So if you can figure out a way to avoid paying a lot of taxes, right? Tax avoidance and tax evasion are two different things, right? right? There's two different things, right? So you avoid paying the taxes by putting them into vehicles that will allow you the ability to borrow the money out without paying taxes on it. It changes your wealth structure. It changes how you make money. It changes how you pass money on. So long-winded way of saying, yes, I'm a business owner now, right? I'm a small business owner. I own my, I own my business. I have an LLC. And I want to get life insurance for my company. I can do so as the company, which makes it tax deductible because it's an expense to the business. And I put the life insurance on me, the business owner, right? I also put the life insurance on any other executive in my company. So as I hire people the same way the bank does, I promote them. I can now go ahead and take out a, take out a life insurance policy on that person, mm -hmm. also known as key man insurance in some, in some cases. Mm -hmm. So you guys are partners. Correct. You own the business. You guys both get insurance for each other. Right. The business is paying for it. If something happens to Rob, you get paid the, the, the death benefit to either pay his family because you guys own the business together to pay him out because his he had value to the business. Mm -hmm. So now you take that money, pay out his family, so they're out of the business. Now you're the 100% owner and vice versa, but you also probably have a surplus of money to now reinvest into the business to go find another person who, was, who can be as valuable as Rob was to the business. And all of that is legal and it's, t it's tax deductible and you get the money tax free because it was done through life insurance. Okay, so... Team Sock by Say LLC, mm -hmm. Glad and I are owners. Yep. We we go in and we say, okay, we we want to take out life insurance yep. under the LLC. Correct. And it's there is a is there a term for that? Like is there or it's just it's just a whole life insurance. It's just a whole life insurance against policy. the business. Policy. Against the business. Yeah. It's okay. so I mean I can call it key man insurance because you guys are key people. In uh, the business. Okay, okay, that's where I was trying. Okay, yeah, you key people in the business, okay. right? So you wouldn't just, I, if I'm just, if I'm the person that just, you know, I'm answering the phone for you guys, you wouldn't put insurance on me because it doesn't make any sense. Right. You can find anybody to replace me. Right. But you guys are running the business. Right. If something happens to one of you, it's going to dramatically impact the actual business. And, and how long does the business have to be in? Um, I mean, there's no in time frame no in time existence. Frame. Okay. But it needs to make financial sense for your business. Gotcha. Right, because you don't want to just open it today, and then I tell you life insurance can cost you five thousand dollars a year. You're like, well, I don't have five thousand dollars to pay for it. Right, right. We don't, we're not really having a conversation anymore because <laughs> there's nothing to talk about. Right. Yeah. So, so now let's take it to the next level when we're talking about trust and insurance. Mm -hmm. Can, you, can you, uh, talk to us about that? Absolutely. So trusts are a very important piece in your financial planning. Right. Um, I have clients, some that you know very well have set up their life insurance policies to pay out into a trust. Now, a trust can own the policy and a trust can also receive funds from the policy. The reason why that part is so important, I make it a point to say that, is because we're talking about transferring wealth from one person or one generation to the next generation. Trust in general, they don't die, right? A person can live and die. A trust, once it's created, doesn't necessarily die. So there's something called the death tax in America. Right. There's a threshold of five million dollars or somewhere in that ballpark where if your asset is ab ab above that amount, you're going to have to pay taxes on the excess over that. The death tax percentage is 50 percent. So if you're a 50 percent, 50 percent is the IRS death tax. They take half your money with it and they did no work. 50 percent. 50 percent is the death, death tax. Right? Jeez. That'll change with the IRS codes and all that stuff. That's why they want a lot of employees. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> no, it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And, right. You know, like, you know, in this, if you don't understand the, the concept, yeah. It's a game. It's a game. It's a game. You have to understand the rules of engagement you have to, you to have play to the game. understand the rules to play the game. Exactly. Exactly. So, yes. So, you, you get a, a life insurance policy. You make the trust a beneficiary. 
like I said to you guys before, when you pass away, the money gets transferred out to the beneficiaries tax-free. Now, if I'm in charge of my trust, and, and this is what I said to you guys earlier, when, what happens when you pass money down to the next generation? Normally, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of studies on this that if, one, if the first generation makes, becomes extremely wealthy, the second generation spends half of it. The third generation loses all of it, and the fourth generation starts off like the first one. That's the cycle of how wealth works mm -hmm. when it gets passed down from generation to generation without any rules in place, mm -hmm. right? The trust creates the rules. Within your trust, if it's you know, structured properly and has the right mechanisms in place, you can dictate how much money your children get, how much, how much money they can spend, where they can put the money, who can sell the house, who can't sell the house, if they can sell the house at all, if it has to get passed down from generation. You can do a lot of things creatively with the trust. So the trust is a really... It's like the queen in a chess game. It has the autonomy to do a lot of different things that everyone else cannot do. That's why getting it set up properly with the right people is so important because it literally gives everyone else instructions after you're gone how to move your money. And here's the most important part. It's not a will. It doesn't go through probate. Most people in our community don't understand that a will does nothing for you if you own real estate, like zero. Because when you have real estate and you have a will, the will gets contested. You have to go through court to see who else has rights to this real estate besides you and your brothers or you and your sisters. Every, anyone can come out the woodwork and say, oh, well, that was my dad too. And they said that I get this house too. Well, now we have to probate and contest and find out the truth. Throughout that entire process, someone's still living in the house or not living in the house. Someone's still paying the bills or not paying the bills. Someone needs to deal with the actual physical real estate while you're doing that entire process of contesting it. None of that happens when you have when your prop or your assets are passed through in the trust. That doesn't happen. Wow, powerful. Before you get out of here, I want you to give another example because you had talked about at the end of the day, it's all about finding passive income mm -hmm. to you know to make the money work for itself. Yes. Give us some other examples when you get a term or or a whole life insurance policy. Mm -hmm. Like the first example you gave was, um, you know, getting a, a commercial real estate, um, you know, a buy a piece of property, buy a piece of property. Mm -hmm. Give us some other examples to create some passive income so through getting a life insurance policy. OK, so once you've built up the, some of the cash value in your life insurance policy, you can borrow the money for anything. Right. If you if Glad wakes up tomorrow, he's like, you know what? I got fifty thousand dollars in my account. I want to take it all out, put it in my bed and sleep on it. He can do that. Like it's his money. Right. But I wouldn't tell anyone to do that, so please don't do that. But if he wanted to take the money and go buy a piece of real estate, he can do that also. He can also invest into the stock market. He can also buy a business. So once you realize that the money is there for you, and the most important part about investing in general or being a business owner is having access to capital. That is the number one thing that you need to do as a business owner. I mean, I know Herman was on the show. He talks about, you know, getting business credit and building up your, your business profile. If I'm telling you that you can buy life insurance with access to capital that you got from somewhere else, why would you not have insurance? It didn't cost you anything, right? So there's certain things I can't say because I'm, I'm licensed, but fill in the dots, right? right? You've got access to credit, you've got access to money. Why not set up a policy where you can put the money in there, let it grow, borrow it if you need to, Go invest into somewhere else so that $1 is not working in two, three places because it's in your life insurance policy. It's growing interest. You got a death benefit. It's doing this thing. You borrow against it. You now put into some real estate. It's growing, it's growing equity and value. You pay yourself back. Mm -hmm. You still have the real estate. It's still there. Now, you put it back into a policy. You take it again. Oh, I want to go buy a business. So now I, I, I set up a T-shirt business, and that business starts to make money, and now I pay myself from the from the t-shirt business, I put it back to my insurance policy. So it's always been in my insurance policy. I also bought the real estate. I also opened a t-shirt business. And I said, you know what? I want to learn how to do stocks. I want to start buying some Apple and Tesla and Microsoft for, for my kids. I go back to my insurance policy, borrow some money again, and now I go put it into stocks. So now I, I bought some stock, Disney, all of the big names, Google, whatever it is. It's in there. Those things start to spit off some dividends. Right? I get the dividends, I save up some more money, put it back to my life insurance policy. 
So now at the end of the day, 20 years rolls, rolls by. What have you done over the past 20 years? Well, I had life insurance just in case something happened to me. I want to make sure my family was taken care of. But while I was doing that, I also bought some real estate. That's appreciated in value. We've been getting cash flow from that every month. I also opened a business, which is also making some money. You know what? I don't want to do it anymore. I'm going to sell that business. That's a huge infusion of cash if you sold a business. Or you know what? I'm going to pass it down to the kids, let them run a t-shirt business. I also got some stocks. You've done four different things mm -hmm. with that same dollar mm -hmm. that you could not do if you put it into the bank. Because when you put it into the bank, you take it out. You know, you don't, you're, not, you're not borrowing against it. You physically take the money out and move it somewhere else. And that's the difference when you add life insurance into the... It's, it's not a change, right? And I want everyone to get the mindset. It's not a change. It's an extra step you do with your money that changes how you can use your money. Mm -hmm. And that's all it is. Powerful. Wow, that is powerful, man. Woo. So, wow. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> so wow. I, I, I want to make I, sure we covered all bases here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Rob. I mean, I'm trying to think, like, because with the trust and the house, so the situation where there's a house, a family owns a home, mm -hmm. right? And the, the there's a there's another home. Well, we have two homes, and then they want to build a trust. They want to create a trust. Now. Okay. So now... With that trust, anyone, the beneficiaries in that trust mm -hmm. can take out the, a life insurance from that? No. So how that would work is if you if the, the trust can take out a life insurance policy on the trustee, the, the person that the trust is for, right? The part that you're talking about is what happens when that person passes away. The beneficiaries receive the money, right? So there's right. a death benefit on life insurance. Right. The money goes into the trust, right? So right. it was right. on. It was on dad. Dad passed away. There's five hundred thousand dollars that gets cash infused into the trust. Now, before dad passed away, he set up the trust that once I do pass, you need to take a hundred thousand dollars of this five hundred thousand and go buy and pay off the house, right? Or pay off whatever we own. Mm -hmm. You pay everything off. Mm -hmm. That might leave you with two fifty. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have the asset, but the instructions in the trust are we want to now take this piece of money and we, I want everyone to get their own life insurance. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can dictate whatever you want to say with the trust. So a smart way to do it for a, a family that can afford it is that every single person in the house gets a life insurance policy. Because I told you the youngest you can be is three months old to get a whole life policy. Mm. Every single person in the house. So. Same example, mom and dad, two kids. We all got life insurance. Mm -hmm. The kids' policies are super cheap compared to the, to the parents right, right. because they're so much younger, they're healthier, right, right. everything's in their favor. But if you've been, you've been saving money for your kids to go to college, we didn't even talk about this part. We've been saving money for the kids to go to college anyway, right? 529, mm -hmm. all, these retire, all of these school, these school um, programs. What happens if the kids don't want to go to college? Oh, well, you can pass the money in the 529 to another kid. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's cool. What if we want to help the kids go buy a house, right? Mm. Right. You can't do that with a 529. You can't just take the money out because you didn't have a, a tax implication. So if you wanted to save money for your kids inside of a life insurance policy, you can do that. For the kids, it'll grow because they have a lot of runway, a lot of time in their life. Mm -hmm. You know, God willing, they live to they're your age, right? They're 40, 50 years old. But if they've been saving $2,000 a year for 50 years, You've got a nice little nest egg to do whatever right. you want to do with it. Right. But let's say the kids aren't old enough yet to start accessing their own money. But mom and dad are like, well, we can start buying things for them. We can buy stocks for them. We can buy real estate for them. We can do a bunch of stuff with them. You're borrowing the money from the life insurance policy and putting it into assets for them. They might be in your name, but you also have a trust set up because trust, trust set if up, anything right. happens to you, this Correct. is what happens with the money. Correct. You pay off these things. We take care of, of of, of Sarah and Jason, everybody's in, in good shape. Right. But while you're here, you still have access to the funds. Mm. So you're not restricted as to what you can do with the money. Right? And that's, mm. that's an important piece. Got it. Got it. One thing I want to touch on, I know we're not really talking about retirement accounts, but one thing I do want to touch on is that a lot of people that have um, 401ks and ESOPs and all those uh, 403Bs, mm -hmm. you have to be very careful or be mindful of the fact that you put money into a retirement vehicle mm -hmm. with the hope that when you retire, your income is less, so you pay less taxes. 
That's the reason why you put the money in there is to get the tax break now. And then in the future, you're paying your, your income is going to be less than what it was when you're working. So you're paying less taxes on the money that you saved over time. Mm -hmm. We're in 2023 when we're having this conversation. You guys see the state of our economy. Yeah. You see what's happening with our dollar. Yeah. How do you fix the issue that we have with, uh, with American money? You tax. That's how you generate more money. Mm -hmm. So for, I mean, we all know that Social Security is not like a real thing. You can't live off of it, no. right? It's not going to be there for most right. of us when it's time to retire. Right. But if our tax brackets change in the future, we're talking about 10, 20 years, when we need the money, what do you do at that point? Because we go from paying 20% in taxes, 30%, 40%, 50%. The highest tax bracket ever in, in history was like 90-something uh, percent. Like this is before our time, but the U.S. was there at one point. That's crazy. You don't want to get stuck holding the bag if they have to go back to that right. point, right? right. And that's, that's the whole point of this conversation. Don't give yourself the options, right? So if I can figure out Roth IRAs are an amazing thing. Right. Because they go in after tax and they grow tax free. That's a good place to save your money. The only problem with Roth IRAs, not necessarily a problem, but, but where is your money when you need it? Because you have to wait till you're 59 and a half to get to it. Right. It's it's about giving yourself financial options. You want to make sure that your money is available to you when you need the money, because that's when money is important. When I need right, it, right. if I don't need it, it doesn't matter. Right. Wow. Powerful. Powerful stuff. Wow, man. Oh, I told you episode 50 <laughs> was going to change your life. Yeah, man. Um, I hope I didn't get too deep on you guys. I hope no, I didn't no, go no, too deep. Where, where's, where's, our, where's our basket? We got to do the question. You got the basket over not, here? Where is it? Oh, there we go. Okay. Wow. Secret question before you get out of here. Okay. <laughs> we do this for every guest. All right. Let's see what it is. Pull out a question. All right. And, and while he's, I think we have not a question that. in the audience. No, not this one. <laughs> I think we have a question in the audience. You oh, know, yeah. That's a question. Is yeah. question? Yeah, okay. that's a question. Hold it, hold it, hold, hold, right. that, hold Questions? that, hold that. We got a question in the audience. Question. So um, you have a young person who's about maybe, let's say, 20, 21 years old. They come into some money, mm -hmm. um, and their main goal is maybe to pay off little debt that they may have acquired when they turned 18. You know, they ran up credit cards, mm -hmm. things of that nature. What would you say to that individual? Do you tell them to take the money they came into and, you know, get themselves a life insurance policy and then, you know, do whatever from there? Or do they pay off the debt? What would be your recommendation? Well, there's no one cookie cut answer for everybody, right? So it's going to be based on that person's particular situation. Uh, we're just going to assume a few things, right? We're going to assume that they got a large uh, inheritance, right? So someone that they knew had life insurance and they got a couple hundred thousand dollars. Normally at 21, you don't have that much debt. So let's say they have to pay off $25,000 in miscellaneous credit card debt or whatever, right? That leaves them with a couple hundred thousand dollars left over. They may, they may not need to put all of that money into life insurance, but I would definitely suggest putting some of it into life insurance because that money at 21, you don't know what the rest of your life is going to look like, right? We're, we're in college at that point, most of us. So we don't know when we're going to get married, when we're going to have kids, if any of those things will ever happen. We don't know who we're going to be responsible for. So if we get a policy at such a young age, it's going to be relatively inexpensive to keep for the rest of our life, and we're not really worried about the money. So we park it there, let it grow, put some of it in other places. You know, maybe they want to try a business and they want to travel the world. They can do a bunch of things at that age, but their backup or the safety net for them will be the money that they sort of stashed away for, for whatever that rainy day may be. Um, great question because it made me think of this. Some people heard the term of a one pay, where you can dump a bunch of money into a life insurance policy at one time and never pay for it again. That is a plausible option, but you have to be careful about tax implications, about when you put a bunch of money into a life insurance policy all at once and you don't make any future payments. Um, the IRS has a, has a rule um, of seven years. If you pay into a policy for seven years, you can withdraw and borrow money from it. Sorry, not withdraw. You can borrow money from it without any tax implications. If you don't hit the seven-year mark, you're going to pay taxes on the growth of your money when you start taking it out. So something to keep in mind, if you do have a large sum of money, there's ways to, to structure it so that you avoid the tax issue that you could have if you jumped it all in at one time. Yeah. But thank Any you for the question. Wow. Any other questions? All right, cool. You got the, yeah, I got the question. You got the secret question of the day. Question. All right, let's, let's see what it says. 
question is, what would you do if Instagram crashed today? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a, this is a very interesting question, right? <laughs> so um, I would do what I was doing yesterday. I don't live my life online, right? Mm-hmm. So Instagram is a great tool. It can help you to be connected. It can help you grow a business. Mm-hmm. But you shouldn't necessarily live your entire life online. So I would pick up my phone. Now, the question would have been crazy if what would happen if I lost my cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> then I can't call anybody. <laughs> it's in there. It's in there. <laughs> yeah. At that point, I just pick up my phone. I'm calling my friends and family. And, you know, we're, we're trying. There's, there's other ways to connect with social media. But I'm a firm believer in, you know, this is important. The face-to-face, the you feel the energy of people because you're disconnected when you're online. Mm-hmm. You don't really get to know what's going on with a person. You don't really get to feel their vibe when you're not with them. And, you know, a lot of people line on online anyway. So Instagram, Instagram's a lie for the most part. No doubt. No doubt. Yo, man, we really appreciate you, man. Thank you for mm. doing this. Before you get out of here, two things. Give them one last final bar mm-hmm. and let them know where they can find you. Okay. Um, last piece thing I will say is that no matter where you're at in life, you can always do better. You can always be better. So plan for the future. Pray for the best, but plan for the worst. Do the things that your future self will thank you for. Mm. And if you want to reach, reach me or contact me, uh, Instagram is the best way. We're talking about Instagram, right? Yeah, Instagram is the best way. Um, my, my handle is at Andre underscore talks underscore green. Um, you can, I'll give you guys my contact information to put it into the, um, into the podcast. Um, you can send me an email. I do free consultations for people. My team will review mm-hmm. current policies. We'll talk about future policies. Okay. We can do all types of insurance. So it's not just about life insurance. Mm-hmm. If you have any just regular general financial questions, if I can't help you, I will refer you to someone within my network because I vetted that person. Mm-hmm. And that's probably another big thing. Make sure the person you're talking to is knows what they're talking about. Right. You know, you trust them. And, you know, hopefully I can be of service to you. And that way I get to pass it forward to my community. All right. This, that's, wow. This, this is awesome, man. You, you, you're you like a wealth of knowledge. I you appreciate know, that. Wealth Thank of you. knowledge. Uh, we definitely appreciate you. And definitely if our audience say team, they heard it on Team Sock by Say, hey, I don't know. They're going to get a discount. I'm going to send them a little something extra. Yeah, 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 something. <laughs> we might have to get some T-shirts, yeah, you know. Get some, some T-shirts. We're going to get something extra. <laughs> hey, um, thanks again, man. You know, appreciate when we you. when we met you a couple of weeks ago, you was like, yo, I want episode 50. And yeah. Got you got it, it bro. And, and thanks appreciate again things for the balloons. Things. We appreciate it. No yep. problem, um, Andre Green, y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you guys before for we get me. No doubt. Before we get out of here, Rob, House, housekeeping items. Housekeeping items. Um, thank you. Thank you all. Remember, subscribe, share, comment below on all social media platforms. Team Sock Passe. Team Sock Passe uh, podcast. Remember, on YouTube, down below, the comments are coming in. I see the comments. They're coming in from old episodes. This one right here. <laughs> a lot of questions. Yeah, it's going to be a great questions. conversation for yeah, sure. Yeah, it's going to be a lot. Um, thank you to uh, New York Beauty Suites. Um, also, thank you uh, Lusa Brooklyn sponsorship. Also, we got Sweet One Double O. Sweet One Double O. Thank you. We're still waiting for our grass. <laughs> Atmosphere. Grass wall. Grass wall and all <laughs> and, of and that. And shout out to Joel. Shout out to Joel, our man behind the scenes, in front of the scenes. He, and um, I think that's it, man. That's it. Team Sock Passe. Team Sock Passe. We out. We out. LS Cream, the perfect blend of spices and tradition inspired by Haitian cremas. Please drink responsibly. Beep, 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 beep.